Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Real Me In, colon, a movie podcast where you didn't really ask for it, but hey, I'm going to give it to you anyways. This is a podcast where I talk about anything, everything, and I want anything about movies. I'm your host Chase Lee and hey guys, listen, if you were searching on the internet for that, that uh, traditional Sunday porn and you accidentally came across this podcast and you're not a movie fan, well hopefully I can convince you to be one this is episode 177 guys and welcome if you're new to the show brand new brand spanking fucking new to the show hopefully i didn't scare you off but anyways what i typically do on the show is i will go over some movie news that happened throughout the week i will go over some trailers that happened throughout the week as well and i will have my reviews of movies that come out on friday and then of course box office results for the weekend uh and also i have a co-host named joel who uh was on last week he announced his his co-host duties and he will be on most of the shows he didn't want to be on this one um uh, cause he's, he's, uh, he's terrible. He's a terrible person. No, I'm just kidding. He's, uh, he's, he's busy. And so he'll be back next week, but, uh, I typically have a co-host, but it's just me. I am flying solo where, like what I've normally done for the past <laughs> three years anyways. So, um, uh, but this show is a little different. Uh, all that stuff I, I listed to you in terms of movie news and trailers, that ain't going to happen this week. Um, so throughout the whole past week and a half, I've been uh, attending the 2017 Dallas International Film Festival, and I saw 11 movies there. So this whole podcast, um, this is the layout for today. I will be reviewing all 11 movies. Plus, I will have my review of a movie I saw in theaters yesterday and a movie I saw on Netflix yesterday that dropped this past Friday. So 13. 15 movie reviews total holy shit buckle up just whatever you feel like is gonna fly off of you buckle up because it's gonna be a bumpy bumpy ride so that is today's show guys is i'll be going over just kind of my overall thoughts of the festival have my reviews of all those movies and the two uh bonus movies that you'll have to wait until the very end um and so that is the format for today's show and then i will also do the box office results for the weekend that's never going to change but you know usually when the festival uh comes around each year this the, i i focus an episode primarily on that because i want to showcase some of these movies uh some of these smaller films and whatnot and to be honest with you, there was nothing that fucking came out this week. Did you guys really think I was going to go see Smurfs and like really just like degrade myself? No, <laughs> please. I'll save that for other movies. And then, of course, going in style, the um, the retirement elderly home people, um, uh, Robin Banks in their 70s. You, you know, it's just... Um I'll pass on it. So I just... I looked at the... I looked at the movies coming out this week and I was like, I... No, I'll just review all the the films I saw at the festival. So, all right. So, without any further ado, guys, let's get this started because there's a lot to go over. So, the 2017 Dallas International Film Festival, also known as DIF, um, so that has been happening in the past week and a half, and it actually ends today. And I could have saw some movies yesterday and today, but I'm just I'm exhausted, guys, and I just need to catch up on some TV shows and whatnot. Um, so. This is my fourth year doing this, and I thought this year, to be honest, and if any of the um, the people that run this festival are listening to this podcast, but they're not, because I'm a joke amongst the uh, press community. But, um, you know, this is my fourth year doing it, and apparently um, the ambulance out there agrees. Uh, you guys hear that? It's pretty loud. Um, but anyways... I thought this year was, it was whatever. The the selection wasn't that good. I didn't really find any movie that stuck out and really was very memorable. Maybe one of them that I might be talking about, but in terms of like just overall scope, it's just they're very like there were solid films and they were very or very average. I just never felt like there was any one that kind of popped and was you know like fantastic like top 10 material of the year. And who knows? I could have missed some because I only saw 11 of them and they play over 100 of them. So, you know, I only saw about a tenth of what they even offer. So I picked the ones that I, I, I like, I read the plot synopsis to and I thought were really great. Or I, I liked a specific actor or actress in it. Or I liked the subject matter. I basically just, you know, every year when I do these festivals, I just kind of pick and choose, you know, which ones might be good. And I take a gamble on them. I really do. So um, these are the 11 films that I saw at the festival. Um, but you know, as much as I thought this year was kind of bland in terms of selection, I still like going to this festival. I still like covering it because it is one of the best festivals, um, 
around for sure and you know it's just right down the road from me so it's just very local and whatnot but um yeah it's my fourth year doing this if someone is listening that runs a festival i still enjoy it and you guys uh, kick a lot of ass and whatnot so thank you for everything so guys let, let's let's fucking begin um 11 films let's start with number one the first one i saw was dealt and now this one is a documentary and it showcases uh, uh richard turner and he is a blind magician hmm did i hook you right there with that plot synopsis um so it just kind of shows like you know how he grew up and you know um it just shows uh, what he does at his craft and just you kind of just get to see him perform and you kind of get to see behind his life a little bit and you know just um some of his childhood and whatnot i I thought it was a pretty solid movie and the one thing i can appreciate about the most is that this 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 man even though he has this disability that what some people would consider he doesn't let that slow him down and that's one of the major themes of this documentary is that it doesn't matter what you're thrown at in life and it doesn't matter what kind of like disadvantage is thrown your way you need to make the most of it and turn around to a positive thing and on top of all that this guy was super determined to be the best at what he did and to be a blind magician i still have no idea how the fuck he did any of those card tricks you have to keep this in mind when you're dealing with cards they all feel the same or maybe to him maybe he felt like different grooves and textures on the card for specific ones but even then how in the fuck do you deal with with a bunch of cards and know where they're all at and know how to do the trick like it's just it's such a fascinating um movie about this guy that basically lives his life with a deck of cards in his hand and the the determination of what he does and just it kind of just shows all of us that there's no excuses you need to get up and pursue your passion you need to practice at it you need to discipline yourself at it like it's just it's a really good documentary for sure, and I think it actually won the documentary prize at the film festival. And uh, I thought it was solid overall. I think the character it's, um, himself is interesting. I think his family is interesting. I think um, um, one of the most heartbreaking scenes in the movie is when he's a kid and he's describing um, how his vision was lost. And he, he said like he was in math class and he was just doing a problem. Uh, on the board that the teacher put up and he said that um, he started seeing these like black blobs kind of form in the middle of his eyes and like they started just to um, ultimately take over and stuff and it's just it's scary like can you imagine if you sat there and (laughs) you're just living your your day-to-day life or whatever and then your fucking vision goes like I'm already blind so I, I don't know if um, if I went completely blind, it would suck uh, because you know when watching movies is your passion, you gotta watch the movies. Now I do realize that you know blind people do watch movies, but to be honest with you, I'd rather be deaf and watch movies just because I could read subtitles and whatnot, and um, I can get an overall sense of the story if I see it visually. It's just if I just straight up just hear it, I just I wouldn't be able to do it. But um, yeah, if you guys are looking in for you know, a documentary with, like, a good message and um, just seeing this guy be determined to do the best that he can. I, I would highly recommend this one. I-, I don't think it drags at all. It actually it flows very nicely. It's entertaining, and you even get to see some clips of him do, uh, uh, you know, his job right there in front of you, and you're still kind of in awe just at, at the sheer fact that he can even do this. So I gave Delt a B. I think it's a solid documentary. It's not my favorite documentary. We'll get to that in just a second, but um, uh, I I think for what it is, it is fine, and I think the character himself is fascinating enough for you to actually want to care about the movie. So, that is the first film. Uh, Second film I saw. This one was interesting, to say the least, and that would be the 80s throwback monster movie the void now this one as of right now has the highest view count on my youtube playlist and i think i know why thank you chris stuckman for reviewing the film um and that's one thing i will i will give chris stuckman credit for is every time when he reviews something and i review it that's like obscure movies those views kind of spill over so thank you for that but um uh, the void i'm not gonna lie this was my most anticipated film of the entire festival 
I was looking forward to it because I saw the trailer and I, I, I saw the practical effects and the makeup of the monsters and it felt like the thing and with the setting of Halloween 2, maybe a little bit of Hellraiser and Poltergeist. Like, it just looked like this blender of like many different films that I really love in the horror genre and really just kind of made it all its own. So I watched the movie. I will say for the first hour and 10 minutes or so, I was hooked. I really love the practical effects in this film. And it really is an 80s throwback. I really like the disgusting nature of the violence and the gore and stuff. It just really has like this thing quality. It really kind of harkens back to John Carpenter's uh, classic back in the day with um, um, the creatures and the effects and the makeup and whatnot. So that's the highest praise I can give this movie. And throughout the entire film for like the... Uh, first hour and 15, 10 to 15 minutes, I was engaged. I was riveted. I wanted to know where this was going. I, the, the mystery was there. These characters were so obscure and they were just, they were all stuck in this hospital with a bunch of, you know, weirdo cult people around them with black triangles on their face. And you're like, oh, I'm, I'm hooked. I don't know what's going on. They're trying to figure it out as well. So you're kind of like thrown into the dark, just like the characters are. And so the violence was over the top and delicious. <laughs> um, now, some of the characters are a little bit underdeveloped, and there's not really much to them, but they were still intriguing enough to kind of follow around through the story, and uh, the way the movie is shot is is very horror-like. It's very um, uh, kind of gorgeous in some shots. Some of the shots are a little too dark, uh, and you can't really see what's going on, and that does uh, have some handy cam elements or some fast editing that you know, I just, I hate that shit, like, I, I, there were some scenes that, you know, it would, it would show what was happening, and it was wonderful, it would stay there, and then there would be a couple shots where it was just very all over the place, but, um, I think for the most part, the actual story is, is good, and I like the monster elements, and I like the sheer fact that it's, you know, killing people, and they have to go hunt it down, until we get to the last 15 minutes, this is where the movie falls apart, in my opinion, once we get into like the f- uh, final portion of the third act, the movie itself and the story takes takes it into this weird turn to where it doesn't really make any sense, and they're really just kind of throwing everything into this kitchen sink. And you know, when the movie ends, you're like, oh, that was kind of unnecessary. Like, I just I felt like the film was a little too ambitious for its own good. I felt like the directors had a lot of ideas that they were throwing into this film. And really just kind of go go there and just go crazy, which is fine. But when you have like a certain thing set up for like the majority of the film and you, you veer off and you do something completely different, it doesn't really mesh well with the movie. And it really does feel like two separate stories um, kind of colluding uh, uh, and, you know, going towards each other. And it just, it doesn't, it, I just felt like there was friction. Like those two stories were bouncing off of each other, not in a good way. So... I thought the last 15 minutes were a little just too out there, and I think that's where the story falls apart, and I really uh, do think the directors didn't know what they were doing, and they were just trying to throw something ambitious and mysterious about it, but it really didn't make sense for the overall story. And on top of all that, the acting wasn't, like, too good to begin with, and, you know, um, I, like I said, I was more intrigued by the, the, the effects in the story more than the... The, the characters, because uh, like I said, some of the acting was just not good, and some of the dialogue was uh, pretty bad, but I, I, it's it's a very weird one for me, because on a technical level, I can appreciate the, the makeup effects, the monsters, and the way they look, the gore, it really just has like this 1980s throwback vibe to it, I do like the story for the most part, I think it's interesting how they mix in like cults and this monster thing like that stuff was intriguing it's just it kind of falls apart uh towards the end the acting is really not that good but the main character is um uh main character is pretty good i will give him that the the police officer if you see if you have seen the movie uh some of the cinematography is is very beautiful very creepy and does provide like that that ominous tone you would want from this type of movie but then sometimes it'll get a little too dark and a little too shaky with the handy cam and the movie clocks in around like 90 minutes, so it's not like it's not a long movie to sit through. So if you do like gory monster throwbacks, I would suggest it, but just be forewarned that 
the last like 10, 15 minutes might be a little just too out there and a little too confusing. And uh, it even confused me. Like I was just like, that, why? Like this is not the route I thought it would go and it just it didn't really make any sense. So um, I'm going to give The Void a B-. minus. Um, I actually was going to give it a straight up B throughout while I was watching. I was like, this is a solid little horror film. And then it just completely just unravels itself. And I'm like, that's a huge uh, problem with me. And it just, it really just didn't make any sense. Like I said, it, it feels like two separate movies, but I can appreciate the test technical aspect and, uh, using as much practical effects as possible. So the void B minus the third film, you know, I love myself a good documentary. And if you can find like the subject matter uh, intriguing, it, it could be one of the most riveting things ever. So you guys know that I like movies. I don't think it's uh, any shock to people. I mean, fuck, I'm doing a podcast over movies right now. So the third one was called Score, a film music documentary. And as you can probably guess from the title, it features many composers throughout the uh, movie industry, and we kind of get to see their their take and their uh, their style and just how they work in this this world of composing music for film. And it was fascinating. I love music uh, musical scores in uh, in films, even and, and soundtracks as well. So when I realized that there was a documentary, I was like, I have to see this. I, I, I have to see, you know, what they do and how they structure it and whatnot. And just going through the whole beginning of how music has affected film and whatnot. And I wasn't disappointed. I really love this uh, documentary quite a bit. Um, I do have one issue with it. And it's just kind of a minor one, but we'll get to that in just a second. But overall, the positives. I love the fact that they got a bunch of different composers. Anywhere from... You know, Danny Elfman to Jerry, or they didn't get Jerry Goldsmith, but they mentioned him. You know, of course, John Williams. And, um, uh, hell, they even got uh, the composer to fucking Despicable Me and the Smurfs. And even he, like, he was very intelligent. He was like, yeah, I have a, uh, I have a very distinct style. And, you know, I, I, I do, like, these off-kilter type of scores, but it works for what I'm doing. And it's just like, this fucking guy's a genius. But he's just, you know, he worked on pretty bad movies. But, you know... And, of course, they they get someone from, like, Mad Max. They get people from lesser films that you may not even – wouldn't even think about the score. And they just kind of interview them and get their whole perspective on the entire industry itself and, you know, uh, just their own unique style. Because the, the composer to, to Mad Max Fury Road is not going to have the same style as, like, a Danny Elfman from, like, you know, the, the Batman film, the Keaton film. So um, everyone's got their own – different type of way they approach music and it actually works for the film that they're hired to do so it actually works out for the better um now the film starts out with um them explaining music how and how it was important especially during the silent film era because during the silent film era film was silent and the way the film would be uh, kind of pushed along is with musical cues to kind of really accentuate what was happening on screen with either the characters, the dialogue or whatever, uh, or the action. So music has been a, a huge part of this industry way back since the silent film era. So um, it, it, it was just interesting to see how it kind of like transformed through each decade and how each decade had like a specific type of flavor to it. Like for instance, when we got into the 70s and it was, you know, Jaws and Star Wars and stuff, it was more like epic blockbustery music when we got to the 80s it was more techno poppy based music the 90s was also very good and they even talked about how modern music today has more of like this this kind of like diverse look to it like for instance they interviewed Hans Zimmer and how he has like a rock opera type of like um sound to it um you know it's just it was just kind of really um uh, intriguing to hear them all talk and you know just to see them work and how some of them actually compose their own music or how some of them stay in the sound booth and let someone else compose it so they can kind of listen to everything so because when you listen to these uh uh movies and their music and whatnot you think like oh it's just you know some guy that creates music and he's up there and composing whatnot and you just lay it under the movie and you're done no there's a lot of work that goes into it a lot of layers that you have to do especially if you're a one-man show and you don't actually have uh, the enough money in the budget to actually hire a bunch of like musicians um, 
to compose as an orchestra and you're like by yourself and you have your computer and you have a bunch of instruments around you and you gotta create like this unique score by yourself and like even that is um really hard and whatnot and i i can tell you guys this right now that and i think that the main thing that they were trying to point out in the documentary is that music can change everything in a movie you can change the way you feel you can change the way um how it is tonally like it's very um important how uh the music is played in a movie because can you imagine if like a movie like schindler's list had like you know upbeat type of happy music it completely uh, demeans the entire purpose of the film and creating this really epic historical drama and then it turns into something kind of goofy and silly you know so um they just kind of pinpoint how music can affect uh the way people think about a movie and the way people can feel about a movie you can be the sole perpetrator into um determining how you feel so I thought that was kind of interesting. Just overall, guys, it's a really well done documentary about music and film, and they really do interview a lot of people with um, uh, movies under their belt that you would never even think about. You're like, oh wow, they did that movie. Um, so yeah, I really like score a film music documentary a lot. The only downfall I would say about the documentary is I wish it would have explored a little bit more in the silent film era, but that was just more selfish anything uh because the documentary is about an hour and a half long it's it's at the right tempo it's at the right um type of speed and so i just thought maybe they could have added five to ten more minutes extra of the silent film era and just a little bit more back in the day because they really do kind of start with like the 70s and move on up and stuff because they were saying that you know once the blockbusters came out that's when it kind of changed the game for music uh which is true but i i wish i would have saw more of um you know, the past and the silent films, but they, they do touch upon it. I just wish there was a little bit more because I'm selfish and I'm an asshole. So, uh, score a film music documentary. I'm going to give an A. I, I, I loved it. Not, not top 10 material, but you know, just for what it was, what it set out to deliver. I enjoyed it. So that's the third film and the fourth film. You guys, we're not even halfway done. <laughs> so just, Hey, kick, kick back, relax, and just, um, just enjoy the ride. Enjoy this, uh, diff ride um the fourth film i saw and this was actually the first one i saw in theaters because the other three uh, i got to see them via screeners so thank you for that from the studios or filmmakers or whatever thank you the fourth film this one's called mine now i didn't know much about this movie going into it i just knew that army hammer was in it he stepped on a landmine he can't move and it's basically just a one-man show of him stuck in the desert so you're probably thinking to yourself, like, oh, it's going to be, like, one of those, like, uh, one-man movies, disaster or whatever. And, you know, we get this. It's going to be, like, a Buried uh, with Ryan Reynolds. You know, he's stuck in a coffin for nine minutes. Like, can it be intriguing? Can it be compelling? And it, it was for the most part. Um, I I liked it. I, I liked it quite a bit, actually. Um, I do have some major issues with it. But for the most part, mine kind of plays out. Um, as a good suspenseful thriller with actually more uh, depth than you would imagine. As the movie kept progressing, it, it, it really kind of started unraveling this character that Army Hammer was playing and really kind of got to the nitty-gritty of his childhood, got to the nitty-gritty of, like, even he has, like, you know, problems that he's trying to work out at home. He's not, like, this goody two-shoes um, person in the Marines. Like, he's got issues as well, and he was trying to, you know... Uh, overcome those issues while he was on this landmine because the landmine that he stepped on was kind of a metaphor for the um not be able to not uh him progressing in his life not moving on from his past type of deal and i thought that was genius i thought that was brilliant how they integrated the 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 mind into the actual character in the story which made uh um which made you care about the characters even more so I think for the most part, it plays out like a good suspenseful thriller that has some really good dramatic elements to it. The problem with the movie that I had the most was that the directors had this weird tonal shift where it would be really intense in one scene and then there'd be an, like, an extra ancillary character that comes into the middle of the film and he's kind of goofy. And it, they kind of played off as like a comedy for a little bit. I'm like, ah, this really doesn't work. And 
Um, th- throughout the movie, you kind of see where this character goes, and at the end, you see what he was meant to do in the movie, which I, I appreciate, but when you're introduced to him at first, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm not really buying this. Um, another thing I didn't really care for was actually everything leading up to the first hallucination in the movie. Now, from the beginning of the movie up until that point, it was fine. It was interesting, I guess. And I'm not going to lie, Army Hammer struggled a little bit in terms of acting and whatnot. He was just kind of flat, in my opinion, or really kind of forcing out his lines. But once we got to the first hallucination in the film, because you guys can probably guess, if he's out in the desert for many, many, many hours, he's going to get dehydrated and hallucinate. So that's not really a, a, a spoiler. It's like, you kind of figured that was going to happen. Anyways, when the movie hit its first hallucination with the main character, I felt like the movie actually found its footing and really kind of um, spun the movie on its head and was like, oh, this is what the movie's actually about. And I was like, oh, you should have introduced this shit way earlier because I was almost checked out um, before that point because I was like, well, the acting is a little stale. This ancillary character is stupid. Um, uh you know, some of the lines of dialogue are really bad, and it's just, I was not really buying it, but it really picked up after that point, and really kind of showed its true colors in terms of, like, what it was trying to deliver in terms of emotion and depth, and when I was like, okay, okay, so from that point on, I really enjoyed the movie quite a bit, um, and I thought it was, like I said, really kind of um, soaked in intensity, while still having, like, that emotional depth to make you actually care about the character, <clears throat> excuse me, especially towards the end when every, when the shit's going down and whatnot. So, um, yeah, so I think for the most part, the directors kind of knew where they were going to take the story and whatnot. And like I said, it got better as it went. Um, but that whole, like, maybe first half of it or maybe first quarter of it was a little bumpy, a little rough to kind of get into. And Army Hamber, I just called him Hamber, Hamburger, Army Hamburger, um, Army Hammer, um, like I said, the first 20 minutes was rough. However, there was a couple scenes in the movie where I felt like he was really delivering his performance very, very, very well. And I was like, this is why he took this role, and this is why he is one of the best up and coming. If, if, he, can has, if he can have the right role, he can deliver. Like, this is, you guys got to keep in mind, this is also the same guy that was in the social network. So I know he's got it in him. It's just that he's been kind of choosing mediocre projects since then. But there was a couple of scenes in this movie where I was like, wow, this is literally him and no one else. He is carrying this scene right now, and I really feel bad for him right now. Like, this is how good Army Hammer is. And I was like, I was really impressed. So I think Army Hammer found his footing, pun intended, um, throughout the movie. And he really kind of got more of a grasp on his character. And you really start to actually care about him more and care about his past and, like, you know, um, what the landmine represents, like I said, you really just start to get into it, so, um, yeah, I really enjoyed his performance for the most part, and everyone else was fine, I I mean, the supporting cast was, is whatever, but it's mainly his movie, he's the one that's stuck on this mine, and he's the one that you want to follow, and he gets, uh, more fascinating as a character as the movie progresses, I thought the movie, uh, uh, visually, it was fine. There was a couple of shots that looked really, really good in terms of how they, you know, placed Army Hammer in the the frame and um, how they showcased the desert and whatnot. There was a couple of shots that was like, ooh, that was it was really great cinematography. But for the most part, it's, it's fine. It's serviceable. It carries the movie. But um, and, and as far as like uh, uh, time length, it's been an hour and forty something minutes. Like I said. The whole, like, beginning stuff and, like, initially stepping on the mine and, you know, all that stuff and the goofy parts, I was like, it really kind of drags the movie. But I'm telling you guys this. Once we get to the first hallucination scene, for some weird reason, it picks up for me and I really got invested and it actually started to find its 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 rhythm with the film. And it didn't really seem like it was dragging. It really kind of found its focus and kind of just went forward with it. And then at that point, I, I did not care about the time length. I was like, oh, I don't, I don't give a shit if this is two, more than two hours long. I'm still invested. So I think it's kind of spotty in terms of the editing, but I, I think for the most part, it, uh, it, it works. So 
I really like mine quite a bit, even though the first 20, 30 minutes or so is kind of iffy. So I'm going to give mine a B minus. Um, I would still recommend it, and I still think uh, Army Hammer is one. Excuse me, one of the best, and I think uh, he's the main reason to go, to go see it. So if you were curious about mine, I, I still say check it out. You might not find it as like the best movie ever, but I still think it's a, a, it's a solid film. It's a little step below solid, but I, I still think it's worth a watch for sure. Just to see and try to convince you if uh, Army Hammer is good enough for you or changes your mind or whatnot. Because I, I, I do think he gets a bad rap sometimes, and I think you need to watch films like this to see uh, just him kind of evolve as an actor. So that was the fourth film. And the fifth film I saw, um, I was looking forward to it because I heard a lot of great things from South by Southwest. And, you know, it's it's written and directed and starring from a first-time um, kind of writer-director. So I was like, ooh, a debut movie? Like, this is going to be really good. And it was Mr. Roosevelt. And I got to tell you, I liked it. Um, so, yeah, for this one, I didn't know what to expect. I just knew that it, it got a lot of praise from South by Southwest, and I literally went to this movie because of that. And I wasn't disappointed. It's written and directed and starring Noelle Wells, and she plays this person who is like an actress, stand-up comedian, someone just basically trying to get by in Los Angeles and whatnot. And, um, uh, you know, she gets a phone call saying that's. Uh, Something or someone has died, so she has to go back to Austin, Texas um, to basically confront her ex-boyfriend who her and her ex-boyfriend had this um, uh, cat that died, Mr. Roosevelt, so she wanted to see how it was. And then she realizes that her ex-boyfriend's actually moved on and has a new girlfriend. So hilarity ensues and, you know, um, the ex-boyfriend suggests that the ex-girlfriend live with them uh, for the weekend. So, you know awkward all right so for this one i really appreciate the personality and the charm that noel wells brings to this film in terms of directing and writing it's fresh it's funny it's you know dramatic at some points it's just a very wholesome movie that has really great characters that are grounded and you can actually kind of see these characters in real life I think she did a very solid job in her debut, um, really just kind of showcasing a person that's kind of immature and needs to move on and really kind of grow up. And I think the death of her cat um, is what makes her kind of grow up and really kind of move on from her ex and really just kind of find her way in life and, you know, just like I say, grow up with the maturity that you need to kind of make it in this world because you can't really live off you know couch to couch like that like what she's doing and whatnot and she kind of grows up and learns that she needs to do something better with her life and I think the cat really kind of is the catalyst for that and kind of moves forward with her so I think uh, the characters overall are, are are very well realized and like I said they're people that we can relate to and whatnot and I think Noel Wells directing definitely has a lot of charm and personality to it and a lot of spunk I love that shit so uh, I think she does a very good job in her debut and as far as like the the overall acting and stuff, I think Noah Wells did a very good job. At first, she was very unlikable because, she, like I said, she was very immature. And you're like, oh, fuck, get off the screen. But as the movie progresses, you start to like her a little bit more. And you, you start to see her kind of grow. And you're like, you start to appreciate her a little bit more. And towards the end, you really like her because you're like, okay, she learned her lesson. And she she's really kind of waking the fuck up, uh, so to speak, and really just kind of getting her shit together. So uh, I, I think for the most part, she does a very good job delivering that. She's funny. Uh, she's insightful. Um, and she really is someone that we can all relate to in terms of, you know, finding our footing after we uh, graduate from school and really just kind of growing up um, and uh, becoming an adult. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And then um, everyone else in terms of acting, I thought was fine. Like everyone else was like, it was serviceable. Um, I, w I did really appreciate Britt Lauer, who played the new girlfriend, and uh, she was in the recently canceled show, I can't believe FXX did this, uh, from Man Seeking Woman, uh, I really enjoyed that show quite a bit, and it was really cool to see her step outside that show and do a movie, because I have never seen that before, I thought she was charming, um, uh, yeah, so everyone else was just it, it was fine, um, 
I really like the visual aesthetic of the film because Noah Wells shot this on 35 millimeter film, and it does provide like a, a an interesting film grain to it that really kind of cements it as like a classic looking movie. It kind of looks like a movie you would dig out from the 70s or 80s and be like, oh, I found this Mr. Roosevelt movie. You want to watch it? And it actually plays out like an older film. It actually has like an older film type of like essence about it, and like it almost feels like a lost movie that someone found in a library somewhere. So I do like the the camera it was shot on. I do like the film it was shot on. It does have a nice film grain look to it. Um, and then uh, the music and the overall kind of like editing and structure of the film um, was really well done too. Because like I said, with these, uh, you know, interesting characters and likable characters for the most part, um, keep the movie chugging and really just kind of... Uh, uh, provides for an entertaining experience. Because like I said, when it's funny, it's really funny. When it's dramatic and heartfelt, you actually care about what's going on. So, And I think the music really kind of sets the tone for the Austin setting. So it's also a, a really nice touch as well. So guys, overall, I, I enjoyed it. It, it. It's a very good debut from Noah Wells. And I, I would recommend it. It's solid. I would give Mr. Roosevelt a B. So as you guys can see, there's a bunch of Bs here, and that's what I'm saying. Like most of these are very solid films. Um, so yeah, I have really no issue, like major issues to where like I'm offended from any of these films so far. Uh, we'll, we'll get there when we get there. Um, um, the next film, the sixth film, is Buster's Mal Heart. Now next to The Void, this was probably another anticipated movie. I was like, oh shit. What is Rami Malek going to do? And so, um, I didn't know what this movie was about. I literally wanted to see this movie because Rami Malek was in this. And I really liked f- the first four episodes of Mr. Robot. And I know I need to finish it, but I really liked him in that uh, TV show. And I hated him in Need for Speed. That was my first ever introduction to him. So, I was like, okay, he redeemed himself with this TV show. So, now, how is this movie? And I gotta tell you, this is probably going to be the most difficult movie to review. Because it's so unique. And it's so out there. I don't even know where to begin. And I don't, honestly don't want to... Um, I don't want to spoil anything for you guys. So I'm going to try my best to kind of just be as vague as possible. So um, let, let's, uh, let's... I'm going to do my best to review Buster's Malheart. Alright. So, like I said, going into this movie, I didn't really know what it was about. And what I could tell you, I still don't know what it's about. But I have some interesting theories behind it that um, I I want to discuss. But obviously, I I don't want to spoil this for you guys if you guys are interested in this movie. But Buster's Mount Heart kind of has like this interesting thing going on where it has many different storylines that all kind of play at different times. um, But somehow come together into this very kind of profound movie experience almost. This film kind of touches upon many different things. It's got it's got themes of religion. It's got themes of forgiveness and um, uh, you know, forgive and let go and guilt and sleep deprivation, hallucinations. Like it's just a very unique movie. And uh, like the director said on the IMDb page, it's like Donnie Darko meets Bad Santa. I agree with that. And that would also mix in uh, Fight Club as well. So uh, I. Uh, Definitely an interesting blend of genres, which I think works for the most part, but then it's also its downfall. I think the overall story itself is compelling enough to, for you to be interested. Even if you don't know what the fuck is going on and you are confused half the time, I think you'll still find it um, an interesting way to tell a story. Because like I said, this kind of jump back and forth between a bunch of different timelines. And it definitely has some interesting visual cues in terms of... Um, um, you know, uh, like different plot uh, elements in the story, like, you know, they're told visually instead of just like out, out forthright. Because um, that's the uh, other thing I like about this. It doesn't spoon feed you. It, it, it literally is an abstract film, which I'm totally fine with, but it might turn some people off. It didn't turn me off because I, I loved kind of piecing together like the puzzle pieces in my mind as I was watching it. Even when the movie ended, I was like, that was really interesting. I need to like kind of, go all the way back to the beginning and kind of like just replay it in my head and see like where everything kind of goes and like, you know, what kind of theories do I have about it? So I think for the abstract nature of it, I think the director did a fantastic job and it almost plays out like a novel. Um, 
even to a point where like they literally um say epilogue towards the end of the movie when they're showing a specific scene so you're like oh that, that's kind of cool like it but as you're watching the movie it kind of it bounces back like a novel it just it kind of flows like a novel which i, I really appreciate it's you know it's a different different type of filmmaking and you know, it was just kind of really fascinating to kind of see this character lose his mind a little bit because Rami Malek plays a um, kind of a concierge at a hotel at night. So, you know, he works the night shift and he's got to go home and um, kind of play with his two-year-old daughter. So he's very sleep deprived and you don't know what's real and what's not. And the director kind of takes you down this weird rabbit hole of having you guess what is real and what is not. And um, I think that's what it makes it the more fun to kind of follow these characters into madness like this. And, uh, I, I really enjoyed it for that uh, aspect. I think it's very, it's a very bold film. It's very out there. Um, it even has elements of a Mr. Robot. So if you are fascinated by Rami Malek in that show, I think you might actually appreciate this movie because it has little, little, um, kind of flares of, uh, of Mr. Robot, but it's such a, uh, a unique and bold film that the director wanted to do and I, i'm glad that someone funded this movie so this this director uh could get her vision out there and really just kind of make a film present it and have you as an audience member go what did you think the movie meant so um i, I really kind of uh, enjoy that quite a bit and robbie malik is terrific in this movie he is so commanding in each scene and i feel sorry for the guy because he actually has like eyes that look like he is sleep deprived all the time it's not it's not a dig at him but like mr robot he kind of looks the same way so um but he a little known fact he actually signed on to this movie before he did mr robot so it's just now he's a mr robot and that's what he's famous for now when you look at buster's mount heart you're like uh, this is kind of like a mr robot ripoff but um i thought Rami malik was was absolutely wonderful there was a lot of depth within his character uh he, he was a madman most of the time he was a little crazy, but you kind of, you were kind of along for the ride. You were like, I, I don't know. Maybe you're not crazy. Maybe you're on to something. And I think that's the likability of him as an actor and, um, just kind of like what the character goes through and stuff. Like maybe you, you think that he's not crazy. Maybe you, maybe he's, um, he's stuck in this weird place in life and he's just trying to move on, so to speak. So I, I don't know, but I really liked his performance quite a bit. And he, when touching upon the bad Santa type of element that the director kind of hinted at, he was kind of funny in the kind of like darkly comedic scenes. I, I do think there was a couple scenes that kind of go on way too long. Um, and they should have cut it a lot sooner and they made the joke go on too long and it started to become unfunny. So that's where I was saying the downfall kind of comes in with the tonal shift. I think it works for the most part, but then when it gets to the comedy, it kind of drags out. And, you know, Rami Malek is doing the best he can in those scenes, but it just it doesn't, um, you know, the humor is just not there all the time. But he is wonderful. DJ Qualls is very good, too. I, I have, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I haven't seen him since the new guy, the fucking new guy from, like, 2001 or 2002. So it was really nice to see him in the movie, and he actually did a very good job. Um, the woman that plays his wife is very good. And the, the little girl that plays his daughter was really good. Like <laughs> she was like legit as like a little toddler actress. So I, I will give props uh, to that as well, but let, make no mistake about it. This is Rami Malek's movie. And I think he absolutely delivers and he is commanding on the screen. And, um, he does a really good job playing, uh, uh, the, the roles he's given in the movie. That's all I'll say. Like I said, I'm trying to be as vague as possible. But I really enjoyed this film on a visual level, on an artistic level, a directing level, an acting level. I, enjoy, I enjoyed it quite a bit. And to be quite frank with you, I need to watch it again to where I can really kind of appreciate it and maybe even give it a higher grade. But I think on a first initial viewing, because I, I do need to rewatch this. It is a more than one time viewing type of film. I'm going to give Buster's Mount Heart a B plus. I really liked it quite a bit. And I love like those weird abstract kind of David Lynchian movies. So um, I was already like destined to like it. And, you know, when you have all those elements with like the directing and the acting and the cinematography and the music, um, the music also kind of reminded me of like a David Lynch film. It, it has great elements to where like, even if the story was kind of wonky and like it really was a little too bold. Um, 
I, I would still give it a pretty decent score because everything else around it was great. But luckily for me, I understood most of the themes in the movie. I kind of understood where they were going with it and kind of what they were, what kind of message they were trying to deliver. I do have an interesting theory about it, but um, so yeah, need to watch it again. But Buster's Mount Heart is a very good one for sure. Definitely the most unique film I've seen at the festival. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I highly recommend it. All right, the seventh film. The Spearhead Effect. And this one and another one are probably my least favorite of the festival. I just... I appreciate what the message of the directors were trying to go for in terms of like... Because this movie deals with a lot of police corruption and then it leads into vigilanteism and the vigilanteism is getting out of hand and you know it's all behind this one guy who made a blog and really kind of started this uprising of people called the pioneers who basically take crime into their own hands. And, you know, like I understand like what they were going for and it could have been a very interesting type of thriller. I just thought everything about it was so blah and just so bland. There was no oomph to it. It was just kind of like, yeah, it was there and it existed and that's as far as I'll go with it. Um, so yeah, with this movie, like I told you, it, it focuses on a blogger that's really pissed off at the police. He makes a, a YouTube video, so to speak, about it. It blows up. Excuse me. It blows up. And people get behind him. And they start, you know, this vigilantism where they're torturing, like, you know, pedophiles and rapists and stuff. And, you know, blurs that line of, you know, is it really justice if you're just torturing people, even if the person is, like, worse than you? Like, so it does raise up some good questions. The problem is the story is very flat. I do appreciate the ending. I like the ending, even though I saw where it was going. I I do like it. I do think it ends very sh- strongly, and I think it like ends very disturbingly. But for the characters, but um, even though I saw it coming, I still appreciate it. But everything else beyond that, it's very like I said, just flat. The characters aren't really developed. They're very one note the entire time. Um, the acting is atrocious. I thought the acting was so wooden and it literally felt like they were walk, they were walking on set and they were line reading, uh, which is never a good thing. I never believed anything that the characters were saying. I never really got invested into the story or got invested into these characters problems. It was just more along the lines of, like I said, they walked on set, they read some lines. Um, I thought the directing overall was very flat. There was no, like I said, pop to the film. It was just, like I said, very just standard type of filmmaking. And just, I just didn't really try anything new with it. Um, I, I don't I don't know what else to say. Like, you know, the cinematography for the most part is, is pretty decent, I guess. So I'll give it that. Um, it is a very quick movie. So even though I wasn't really interested in it, I do think it, it has the right kind of like a pace to it. I don't think anything lagged because I was really curious to see where the movie would end up. Even though I had a, 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 a nice idea, I was like, Oh, it's probably going to end this way. And then it ends that way. I'm like, okay, well it was satisfying, I guess. So it was probably the most bland movie and I was going to give it a straight up C. Um, but I think I'm going to give it a C minus because the acting is pretty bad. Uh, to be honest with you, I really thought they were going to go in like a, I honestly don't know what I was thinking. I, I thought maybe that they would kind of take this idea of vigilanteism and, you know, blurring that line and stuff and really kind of dive into the psychosis of it and, like, really kind of get deep into it. But it just turned out it was just a, a standard little kind of gory thriller, I guess, and it wasn't even that thrilling. <laughs> so I really wish they could have gotten more into the actual purpose of these people. And they do kind of touch upon some nice social commentary with like news outlets and stuff and how people view these vigilantes like, Oh, some people actually like it. And some people think it's you know fucking terrible. So I do like that element a little bit. Cause they kind of dive into that. But beyond that, the acting is so bad to where I, I can't really recommend this movie at all. It's just very average, very blah. And it almost just plays out like a, like a skin movie that plays on at 2 a.m. And you're like, uh, or Cinemax or whatever, but you're just like, oh, okay, I guess that helped me fall asleep. But yeah, not for me. So Spearhead Effect, I'm going to give a C minus. There you go. All right. So the eighth film, um, which I really enjoyed, is Unrest. And this is a documentary focusing on Jennifer Bree. 
and she was diagnosed at age what was it 28 or 27 with chronic fatigue syndrome and this documentary just kind of showcases that and kind of just shows her struggles that she has to go through with every day with you know herself and her husband and stuff with this condition and really kind of uh, showcases it to the world as a uh, you know a condition that is very common amongst people and a lot of people don't do anything about it because there actually is no cure for it so going into it once again I had no idea what it was about and I got to tell you, I really appreciate Jennifer Breeze um, kind of uh, bringing this to light, so to speak. Because I had no idea what chronic fatigue syndrome was. A lot of people in the 80s and 70s and 60s just thought people were just sleeping and not wanting to go to work and whatnot. So they were making fun of it and whatnot. But the way she describes it in the film is actually very severe. And, like, you will get, like, severe migraines. Your joints will start hurting. You can't really stand up. And you have to be bedridden most of the time. So your bones start to become weak. And then you can't walk. And it's just... If these people were honestly faking it, why would they want to ruin their lives like that and stay in bed all the time? It just makes no sense to me that people that don't that don't uh, really um, understand it. But I will uh, say that I have more of a, a deeper appreciation for it now. And I really will... Um, kind of get it if I do come across someone with this condition. And so just simply put, this documentary is just to show her and her struggles that she goes through. She interviews several people that also have it. And the fact that like over a million people have it in this country, I had no fucking clue. She interviews these people and, you know, some of them range between like, you know, older people that are mothers and some people that are like, you know, early 20s that have been um, bedridden for 10 years and I really just kind of get their viewpoint on life and how tough it is the fact that they can't leave their bed and they can't go socialize they can't have a normal life and this mystery this mysterious disease is really kind of um, you know putting them down and they're doing the best that they can there's no cure for it doctors don't know what the hell it is like what's the cause of it how they're treated so it's one of those things they just have to suffer from until they can find a cure for it. I mean, there's there throughout the documentary, there's many ailments that can kind of like subside it a little bit, but there's not like a definite cure. It's kind of like what I have. I have Crohn's disease, right? There's no definite cure for it. People could go into remission, but there's no like straight up cure to like wipe it out, so to speak. So I, I get where she was coming from. And maybe that's just because I have a condition myself and I can relate to it. I can relate to her pain, her suffering and her, her just frustration about this this fucking mysterious disease that's taking over her life and she can't really do anything about. And um, on top of, you know, bringing this thing to light, she also goes into, like, good detail as to, like, you know, what people suffer from and, you know, uh, when, it, when it started and, you know, just the many things that um, come along with this condition that really just, you know... Uh, you know, affect people and how severe and how uh, crucial it is. And so it's a very emotional documentary. I I almost teared up several times and it kind of reminded me of the documentary I saw last year, Gleason, which was um, based on the, the gentleman that had ALS and we saw his deterioration from being, you know, normal, walking around, talking and stuff, then kind of getting the disease and suffering from it and not be able to speak and you know he can't really move and whatnot so that was a really emotional uh film um to kind of show the ups and downs of how one day you could be like i'm gonna take on the world even though i have this condition i'm not gonna let it bring me down to the very next day where like they break down and like i can't live anymore because just it's just so it's just so draining emotionally and physically and whatnot and it just uh it really kind of made your heart hurt a little bit and unrest is the same way. Jennifer Breeze is a very, she's a very optimistic woman, right? But then there'd be some scenes where she breaks down and she can't do it anymore. And then her husband will also break down. Well, you know, and then next scene he'll be positive. And it's just, it's a back and forth type of an emotional experience to where like, I'm glad they found the hum, they're, they're finding humor in life to kind of keep going forward. But at the same time, you know, they're, it's just draining for them, and then, like, you, you, you feel bad for them, and it's just like, I, I, I really hope this documentary kind of shows the world what this condition is about, and maybe the doctors um, and scientists and whatever can, can, you know, kind of work together and kind of fast-track a cure for it and whatnot, and to see how 
they can um, ultimately treat this because it's just it just looks so miserable the way they're describing it, and a lot of people just shove it off because it's called fatigue syndrome. And they're like, oh, they're just sleeping. It's like, no, don't be fucking ignorant, you prick. And really kind of understand that these people are not just doing this for the lulls and the laughs and the attention. It's really affecting them. And um, it's just kind of like one of those things like cancer where, like, doctors don't know where it comes from. It's just it just it just fucking happens. And there's not really like a definite cure. But there's many different like treatments and stuff that can kind of slow the process down and make your life a little bit better as they try to find a cure. So unrest, guys, is absolutely just an emotional journey. It's a human story. We can all relate to it uh, in some way, shape, or form in terms of like having these things thrown at us in life and really kind of overcoming them and being as positive as we can. I really loved Unrest a lot. It's a really great documentary. I'm going to give it an A. Um... I actually have no problems with it. It's just one of those things where, like, it's just a very good movie, and I, I'm totally fine with just giving it an A. Um, so yeah, chronic fatigue syndrome. If you don't know what it is, please look it up. And if you want to know more about it, please watch this documentary. You might have a better idea of what it's about. So that's the eighth film, and the ninth film. I will keep this review short and sweet because I didn't really care for this one either. This and the Spearhead Effect are probably the most average kind of blah movies I saw at the festival and this one's cassette a documentary mixtape this was just straight up a stroke fest a a boner loving stroke fest of cassettes and cassette tapes that's all this documentary was doing I was interested in it because um the first like 10 minutes it actually showcases the people that invented the cassette tape and just how the mechanics of it and just the way they c- kind of put all these pieces together and really created something that was revolutionary for portable music. So that stuff was fascinating. But then after that, we just went to several musicians that are like, I love cassettes. They're personal to me. And that was it for the full hour and a half. And like, I, I get it. Cassettes and cassette players and Walkmans and stuff were very crucial in terms of progressing in the music industry. When you go from vinyl, which is a nice at-home remedy for music, then you go to something portable like a cassette and the cassette player, that's game-changing. I get that. I get the the love for this piece of technology. I also like the fact that you can personalize it, you can record your own shit on there, and you can give someone a mixtape, and it could be something personal, and you can have that connection with with someone through a cassette um, tape because they did that for you. I get that. However, this movie is fucking boring and there's nothing more to it than people going, I love cassettes. They're important to me. And I was like, this is straight up just a love letter to cassette tapes with no actual meat to it. And I feel, I the whole time I was watching, I was like, man, this has been really fucking aggravating to edit together because it's just the same shit over and over and over again. The only thing I like about this, like I said, is the inventors of it because they're old as hell and they were really funny to watch. And also some of the cinematography is really, really great. I like some of the um, shots that they framed up with the the tape as it plays or, you know, um, uh, I don't know, some of the stores they went to. It's just some of the the visual stuff was fine. Um but other than that, it was boring as hell. I had to stop it three times because it was one of those online screeners. I had to stop it, take a nap, wake up, and rewatch it because it could not hold my attention. The movie was so slow, and there was no actual, no actual pace to it. It was just, it was just five minutes of someone going, "I love the cassette." Next five minutes, "I love the cassette." It's just, it, it became so. Oh, monotonous and boring. I was like, oh, Jesus Christ, can we please end this already? So, besides some cinematography shots and the the sheer interest of the people that invented it, I did not care for this document whatsoever. There's no point to it. It was just there to let people know that cassette tapes were a thing, and it's and people still love them. I I, I like I like that. I like that people love things, but when you do it for an hour and a half straight and there's no actual substance to it, I just. I can't. I just, I can't even, guys. 
because I, I get it. A lot of people have different types of formats that they listen to music to, whether it be MP3s, digital, vinyls, cassettes, CDs. I, I, I get that. There's a, ni- a niche group um, of people for all those different types, and this is just one of those formats. And to be quite frank with you, I wish they would have just combined everything. Have vinyl, cassette, and CDs all in the same film to kind of showcase, excuse me, what music um, was in terms of at home and portable and stuff before we got into the digital age. I think that would have been more compelling than just focusing on one of them. So that's how I would have fixed it. But um, yeah, this this one's not for me. I have no desire to watch this again. Maybe if I want to take a nap. But in terms of like, hey, I want to watch a documentary, I'm not going to suggest this one at all. So I'm going to give Cassette a C minus. I thought it was just very average overall and I was going to give it a C, but the the length of it and the pace of it is just all over the place and it's just very slow and that's why I'm going to dip it down to a C minus. So cassette, a documentary mixtape, sorry, that and the spearhead effect are definitely my least favorite. So maybe I spoiled the next, my, my final two because um, I actually really dug both of them, but we'll start with the 10th movie that I saw and that would be Rememory. Um, this one stars Peter Dinklage, the good old Dinkmeister, and this one is about memories and capturing your memories um, through a machine to where you can actually, um, you know, record them and you can see like in detail, like in full HD detail on what the memory was, even if you have like a problem remembering it, you the memory will be extracted, you can see it and you can kind of see it for yourself and be like, oh yeah, that's what happened. So Peter Dinklage, something happened to him in his past life. And he has this memory that kind of haunts him. He hasn't moved on from it. And he has an extreme amount of guilt kind of clouding around him to where he can't really function in life, right? It kind of like dictates his life. There's this guy who creates this machine to where he can extract memories and record them from your your brain. And you can essentially see what it was. What was that memory? So you can either relive it and... You know, it could almost be like a a cathartic thing where you're like, okay, I feel more at ease now because I I can move on. Or it just might haunt you. It might affect different people. And that's what this movie kind of touches upon. However, the actual story is, and this is within the first five or ten minutes. This is not spoiling anything. But the inventor of this machine dies. And so Peter Dinklage um, goes on this spree to find out, A, who killed the inventor of this machine and B to get this machine to find out what exactly happened in his memory that's haunting him so he can eventually move on. So it's more of like a film noir type of story to where like Peter Dinklage is like a detective almost trying to figure out, you know, just the puzzle pieces of many different people that were subjects in this machine as it first started and him just kind of asking like, you know, where did he keep this machine and, you know, what do you know and whatnot? So that's all this movie is essentially is just Peter Dinklage going to specific people to figure out who killed him while at the same time with his own motives of getting the machine to, uh, uh, figure out what was in his memory. I like the movie. I, 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 I think it's a solid movie. I'm, I'm kind of on the fence because the story it presented with the whole like film noir detective aspect it was fine. It was entertaining, and it has some really great character moments. But I almost wish the movie would have taken in the direction of the actual machine and the mechanics of the machine, and really kind of getting into your brain and uh, recording these memories and how it affects people. Like I said, because they touch upon that, where like some people might like it, they might find it, you know, soothing therapy to see re- relive your memories. But then some people might fucking hate to relive those memories. So I would have actually rather more seen that on a psychological psychological level than the story that was presented. So I felt like there was a lot of substance there to have a really great meaty story, which they do touch upon, but they more go into this like, you know, detective type of story. So that's kind of my only downfall about the movie is that I wish it would have gone one way the other way with the story instead of the way it went. But what we were given, it was entertaining because I do like, Peter Dinklage is an actor, and he is very commanding on the screen. He's got a lot of depth to him. There's a lot of there's a lot of pain and suffering within him that he doesn't really kind of show on the surface until you really kind of get into the nitty gritty of his character. Then he starts to break down, and he's really you know he's determined um, to get this machine so he can um, 
uh, you know, essentially move on from this this tragedy that happened to him. And I just I love his character. It was complex. It was wonderful, and um, he was definitely the driving force behind the movie. And all the other characters were um, pretty good. They, like I said, they all kind of touch upon um, different different uh like different personalities like you know Anton Yelchin is in, in this rest in peace to where like he um you know he was really frustrated that he was used as a subject and his memories were extracted there was this one lady that was also frustrated there was someone else that thought it was um you know nice and soothing cuz they wanted to relive their memories before they passed on themselves so they showcased a bunch of different people that are have different opinions about the machine so i, I do like most of the characters, but uh, no one's really developed, you know, to the fullest extent as Peter Dinklage's character. So, um, and even when um, you find out like who who killed the inventor to it, it's kind of a lackluster ending. And there's also like a little little piece to the ending and the twist of the the movie to where I was like, it doesn't really carry forward, and it's just kind of left by the wayside. And I really wish that certain people would have you know, know what what happened in the past. And like I said, I'm trying to be as vague as possible because I actually think it's a solid film and I want you to kind of experience it. But So I thought the ending was kind of a little lackluster. But I think the overall direction of the film, it was entertaining. Um, it, it kind of had like this awesome sci-fi suspense um, type of element to it, kind of bend to it. And I, I really do appreciate those types of movies. Um, Peter Dinklage is great. The cinematography is pretty great. I think even for a movie that's almost damn near two hours long, I never felt like I was bored once. It just, it just, um, it kept my attention the entire time just cause I was more fascinated with the machine and whatnot. And, you know, we're getting to a point now in our future where we're going to have machines like that, that can record our memories and shit. So I really liked re- memory a lot actually. And I, I'm going to give it, um, a straight up, uh, B. I think it's a solid film for sure. So that's the 10th film. And the last film of the festival before I get into the two surprise ones for the episode, the 11th and final film, because I actually did see a 12th one, but I'll explain myself in just a second, is It's Only the End of the World, which is uh, written and directed by, I'm not going to say his name because I'm going to fuck it up, but it's the writer and director of Mommy, which came out in 2014, which I love that movie. Mommy is a very... (sighs) it's a very powerful drama about a mother and her son. And it's, it's a very intimate, emotionally damaging movie, but also just very well acted and very well directed and edited to where you just get sucked into that movie as soon as it starts. So I really liked mommy quite a bit. And that was my only reason as to why I wanted to see this movie. I was like, you know what? I love his previous film. So let's, let's get on this. I want to watch um, his next one. So it's only the end of the world focuses on this guy who's on a plane this is within the first two minutes so it's not a spoiler he's dying so he's going to his family's house gonna be up with his sisters and his mom to basically tell him that he's he's dying and he wants to spend like kind of one last you know weekend with them and kind of like you know talk with them and kind of just resolve their their problems and strengthen excuse me their relationships and really just kind of go from there and that and that's the whole movie it, uh, it, it it kind of flows like a play, like a stage play. It's very dialogue heavy. We have this main character who, you know, is just talking to each family member. And we get like specific scenes where they go on 15, 20 minutes long of him just kind of interacting with these people. And we kind of get a sense of what their history was like and really kind of how they're going to move forward in their relationship. And I think for the most part, I like it. And I, I actually recognize that it's a good movie. But... I, First of all, I have no desire to ever watch this movie again. I do think it's boring for the most part. And um, uh, I I thought the actual kind of um, pace of the film was kind of all over the place um, in terms of, because I said, most of it was boring. Some of the parts would actually be like fascinating and I was intriguing by what the characters were saying, but then some of them just would go on and on and on. You're like, okay, can we wrap this up and move on type of deal? And the, the major thing as to why, like, I really don't care for this movie, but I recognize this is a good movie and I'll still give it a good grade, is the characters. The characters themselves feel so distant from each other that I, I actually couldn't connect with any of them. Because they were just so, like, a 
apart from each other and they felt like strangers to a point where like I can't connect to them because I also feel like a stranger to them. And But maybe that's the genius behind the directing because that was the whole point, right? This is a dysfunctional family with a guy that hasn't seen them in 12 years comes home to try to reconsolidate any relationship that he has with these people. So maybe that was the whole point. Maybe the whole point was to feel disconnected to them as they were trying to fight to build this bridge in between them um, so they could actually have a fully functioning relationship. So maybe that was the point. But it was kind of frustrating because I was like, I really don't honestly care about what's going on but the performances and the the directing is so good to where i was like i can kind of forgive it just a little bit so i can acknowledge that it's a good film about family dysfunction and uh, relationships between family members and um you know forgiveness and kind of uh squashing beef um so to speak so you can kind of move on with your life type of deal so i get all that and, and, and I, I I love the intimacy of the film. It's just, like I said, it's boring in some parts, inconsistently edited, and I just don't really care about the characters that much. So, you know, those are kind of my downfalls, but I can, I can still acknowledge that it's an expertly directed movie because it's very hard to focus in on a one-location type of movie, which was a house, and focus in on these characters with heavy amounts of dialogue. That's hard to do, and that's hard to be... Um, slightly interesting to people, and like I said, it works in spurts. But um, I just I have no desire to watch this movie ever again. And it's actually it's shorter than Mommy. Mommy is two and a half hours long. This is ninety nine minutes, and it felt like an eternity. And that's not a good thing. Um, so yeah, and, and one of the other positives I will say is the, the acting is phenomenal. I love Marion Cotillard in there. I love Vincent Cassel. Um, Leah Sadu, Leah Sado, however you pronounce it, from Blue is the Warmest Color, and Spectre, they're all wonderful. And when you have this director, who, when you watch Mommy, is really good at like extreme close-ups and close-ups, these shots and this these cameras are on these actors' faces for the most part. A lot of these shots take place very compactly and very intimately on the character. So as they're talking to one another, you really kind of get lost in the emotion that these characters are trying to portray. And just for me personally, like I said, I couldn't connect with them. But their performances are so good. And the framing is so well done on these shots that you can feel the emotion. You can feel the emotional performance there. And it's very palpable. You'll, You'll have, like, some people, like, not even say a word and you can just see all their like expressions through their, their eyes and just the way they, they look and stuff. They don't even have to say anything. And that just kind of uh, shows you how good the acting is and how um, well shot this movie is. Cause like I said, most of the shots are very close up, extreme close up, but that's his kind of like shooting style is to really kind of hone in on your characters and the family and the situation and really kind of just let the emotions, um, get soaked in these like close up shots to where like that's all you're focusing on. You're not focusing on the noise around them, you're focusing on what they're trying to say. And like I said, works in spurts. Didn't really find it consistent cuz there'd be some scenes that would just go on way too long and I'm like, "Okay, we got to cut this and move on" type of deal. Um so yeah, um what else? Uh the music is very good. It's almost like uh very somber um, very, very dramatic and very, um, um, you know, heartfelt kind of pulls at your heartstrings just a, just a little bit. So I really enjoyed the way the music was composed. So yeah, overall guys, wonderful cinematography, excellent performances, great music, great directing, even though I do find it inconsistent with, you know, the overall pace of it, I'm still going to give the movie a B plus because, on a technical level, it's like expertly done. Because like I said, it is not easy to create a movie that's very dialogue heavy, very character heavy in one location and make it interesting. It is not easy to do. And I think he directed the hell out of the movie. But on a personal level, I could not connect to anyone and it was a little boring. Sorry, I gotta be honest with you. But I'll still give it a B plus because I, I, I do find a lot of great stuff in this. So I'm not going to ever watch it again, but as far as, you know, wanting to check out this director's other works, I can't wait to see what he does next. And you know what I'll say right now, 
it's jealousy because <laughs> this guy is the same age as me. He's literally like, I think four months older than me. He's like 28 right now. And he's made like three or four movies. And it's like, fuck, man. Like, what have I done with my life? Oh, well, I do this podcast for you lovely people. But um, uh, so that, I guess that's my calling. Because I went to film school and not, now I'm more critique films than make films. So I think it's kind of ironic. But um, yeah, it's only the end of the world. I'll give it a B plus, even though I have no desire to ever see it again. So guys... That's it for the festival. 11 films, 11 quick reviews. Um, I know it's not... I, like, I'm trying to get better at my reviews to where I don't break them down into sections like I normal do for you guys. Like, you know, with the writing and directing and acting and cinematography and stuff. I want to kind of just uh, speak about the movies as if they were written, you know, like normal critics do and stuff. I'm just... I realize I'm getting really terrible at this. And I'm getting worse as the years or the months go and whatnot. And I'm trying to better you know, uh, display my reviews better, kind of come across grammar, right? Grammar wise and stuff. So I apologize. This episode is very kind of all over the place and very jumpy. I just, I'm trying a different edit or reviewing style and whatnot. So, uh, please bear with me. Um, so yeah, I actually did see a 12th movie and it was the lost city of Z. Now this is the Charlie Hunnam, Tom Holland movie and stuff about the, uh, lost city of Zen, I believe, but the explorers, um, that went to go search for this and then ultimately didn't come back. And you assume that they found it, but maybe something really bad happened to them and they died and they didn't really make it. And it was maybe a hallucination. I was fascinated by the movie, but the problem is I can't review it because the audio mix was so low in the movie and it might've been the theater. I might have to rewatch this, but like the dialogue was so quiet. The action was so quiet. The effects were so quiet it was just a terrible experience. So two and a half hours of just, yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go to the woods. Yeah, we're gonna go to the woods and find this city. And then, like you know, when action would happen, like it, there'd be like spears like going across like the camera, like, <laughs> like it was just so quiet. And the the sound design, it just it pissed me off. So I can't review the film because. You know, audio is half of what a movie is, and you know that's kind of botched. I can't really review it properly. So that was the twelfth one I saw, but I can't review it. So eleven movies, two thousand seventeen Dallas International Film Festival. Um, like I said, decent selection. My favorite one, I'll probably have to give it to Unrest, and my second favorite would probably be Buster's Mount Heart. Um, even though they're two vastly different, like grade scores I still um enjoyed the ambition of Buster's Malheart and enjoyed the actual quality of Unrest so yeah overall I guess decent selection so um that is my coverage of the 2017 Dallas International Film Festival I'm sure there's plenty of other better reviewers that reviewed these films uh than I just did I, I just felt like I was all over the place but I apologize guys I'm trying like a new style of editing or sorry reviewing so, my two bonus reviews, uh, just real quick. I saw Your Name um, this this weekend. Uh, I saw it yesterday in theaters. And this is the anime film. It, it, it was released in one theater last year. And then it finally expanded this weekend to many different theaters. I saw it and I absolutely loved it. This is top 10 material all the way. It is one of the most breathtaking, emotionally driven animes I have seen in a very long time. I loved basically everything about it. I loved the the dramatic stuff. I loved the the romantic stuff. I loved the comedy elements. None of it ever seemed like it was just jumbling tones and genres all over the place. It just it felt like a very human story and a very um uh human story about life and how life does have comedy. Life has dramatic elements and and it has emotional moments it has romance in it like i just felt like it was just a movie about life and it takes like this sci-fi approach to where like the two main characters can ultimately freaky friday themselves and switch bodies and really kind of get a sense of what the other person is like through their day to day and really kind of get to know them that way and like i said a lot of comedy ensues but then a lot of romance ensues and a lot of connection between these two that have really never met and they have this really strong bond that um 
is just very likable, very charming, and very just uh, powerful. And, you know, the movie has that romance element to it, but surrounding it is this, like, comet story where this comet is, like, shown going towards Earth and whatnot, and you don't know where it's going to hit type of deal. So I thought that was really interesting, and I just I really loved the powerful uh, romance and the powerful drama behind this film. I thought the animation was so beautiful. It's a mix of 3D and 2D cell hand-drawn animation. It's just wonderful to look at. The story is just so great. The characters are well-realized. I love the mix of comedy and drama. It's, like I said, it's top 10 material. So your name, if you can go see it and you are not an anime fan, go check it out. If you are an anime fan, you probably have already seen it. It is absolutely fucking fantastic. I cannot recommend it highly enough. I don't want to say any more. Just go into it and just realize it's about two people that uh, can ultimately switch bodies and they ult- they they have a bond uh, with each other. So it's a really great, unique sci-fi love story. I highly recommend it. I'm going to give your name an A+. Definitely, definitely, definitely my second favorite film of the year so far, right behind Logan. I don't know if it'll stay on my list. It probably will um, towards the end of the year. It's just, I fucking love this movie. So your name, first bonus review, saw in theaters yesterday, absolutely wonderful. Second bonus film is a Netflix film. What? So I saw Win It All with Jake Johnson, directed by Joe Swanberg, and this film was released on Netflix this past Friday, so I saw it. I liked it quite a bit, actually. Now, Joe Swanson is known for uh, digging for fire, drinking buddies, and all these kind of like really interesting indie films that he usually gets the same kind of actors and actresses to play all these roles and whatnot, and it's almost like... um, uh, kind of admirable because it's kind of like what Judd Apatow did back in the day with like you know his Rat Pack with like Paul Rudd and Seth Rogen and Jason Segel and stuff. It's just a, a bunch of people that are very passionate about making film. They know that they're not box office draws, so they just make all these independent films with money they get from other projects and funnel into these um, passion projects. And I really kind of admire that. But when it all was probably my favorite Joe Swanberg movie and definitely my favorite thing that Jake Johnson has done outside of New Girl because he's he's wonderful in New Girl. But when it all, I did not expect it at all. So um, Jake Johnson plays this gambler. He's very addicted to gambling. And there's this guy that comes by his apartment who uh, has, you know, they've run into each other in the past and so he's like, can you watch this bag for me? I'm going to jail for six months. And if you watch it and everything's still intact, I'll give you $10,000. So it's kind of a bad thing because in the duffel bag, uh, ta-da, there's money and he is a gambling addict. So you know where this is going to go. He starts to take a little bit from the bag and he starts to gamble with it. And he, he you know, needs money to you know pay for his rent or you know he meets a girl in the movie. So he's got to take her out and stuff. And you know he gets into a pickle. Where he actually spends all the money. And so he has to figure out a way how to get back. And he gets a job and stuff. And it's a really kind of funny, entertaining, and sometimes kind of heartfelt, um, harsh look at people with addiction. So I thought it was, like I said, a nice blend of of comedy and, and drama with this, this main character who is very unlikable. Because he's spending money, he's very careless, but he is an addict, so you kind of sympathize with him. And you you feel sorry for him. And at the same time, you want him to get better. And, like, he does want to get better in the movie. He's like, "Ah, okay, I'm going to set this shit aside. I want to get better. And I really want to do this right. So he gets a job. He gets a girlfriend and stuff. And you root for him. And I think that really has to do with Jake Johnson's casting. Because he himself is a likable dude. But he can also play douchey characters as well. So the fact that he plays this guy who is a gambling addict and you kind of roll your eyes because you're like, dude, stop spending all this fucking money on gambling. But then you see a turn in the movie where he's trying to turn it around and then you get on the side. And that's because the performance from him is so layered and so subtle. At the beginning, you don't like him. Then as he starts to change as a character, you change your mind about him in the audience. You're like, oh, he's actually wanting to do good. I am behind him now. Because he is charming as fuck. And Jake Johnson is charming himself. So 
it's an interesting character character piece. But like I said, first and foremost, it is a comedy, but it's also got some nice elements of drama. So it's it's a nice, good balance dramedy, I would say. But I really liked his character and just kind of seeing his journey throughout trying to beat this addiction and trying to get all this money back before, um, you know, the guy that lent it to him finds out. I'm not going to tell you whether he gets the money back or not, um, but I will say it's an interesting character study that I really enjoy kind of watching his journey throughout. And Jake Johnson is a likable actor for sure. He kills in this movie. The surrounding cast kills it. I love the, the woman that plays his girlfriend. I thought she was very charming and whatnot and really kind of... Helped him to get back on his feet. I loved uh, Joe Lo Trujillo, Tru- Trujillo or whatever. I I don't know how you pronounce his name, but anyways, he's on Brooklyn Nine Nine. He's in the movie. He plays his brother. I thought he did a good job. Um, uh, who else? Uh, Keegan Michael Key plays his sponsor. He does fine. But like I said, I think the driving force behind this movie is Jake Johnson. Because usually when Jake Johnson is in a Joe Swanberg movie, he's with a group of people. And this group of people has to get through an issue or a problem, like with Drinky Buddies or Digging for Fire. But in this one, yes, there is a supporting cast. But this movie is fully on his shoulders. And this just proves to me that he is he is just very likable on screen. Even when he plays the, the douchey characters, he, he's kind of like an anti-hero much. You're like, I, I still kind of like him, but I hate him. And then when he changes his life around, you're like, fuck yeah, I'm behind him all the way. So this is... His movie, and he completely delivers. And I, I love the actual care that Joe Swanberg, you know, takes on this movie. Because he doesn't paint him out to be a bad guy. He just paints him out to be an addict with a problem that wants to change his life around. And that's someone that's something that everyone can get behind. Um, is, you know, uh, redemption and trying to change your life around from anything that holds you back. And I think Joe Swanberg really kind of made just an entertaining um, movie that everyone can kind of relate to with an interesting character uh, that has a gambling addiction. He co-wrote it with Jake Johnson. I thought the dialogue was really great and some of the jokes were really funny and stuff. So it does have like a huge amount of heart to it, which is what all Joe Swanberg movies have. So um, I thought the overall direction from him was just, it was very spot on and very entertaining um, acting. I did that. So <clears throat> I have to touch upon the cinematography because usually with Joe Swanberg movies, it's it's got the handheld look. It's very indie. <clears throat> it doesn't really feel like epic in scope or anything. But I gotta tell you, the way the movie is shot actually does feel like an epically scoped movie about this gambler taking on the world. But he's just it all takes place in this town. And the reason why I say that is because this film is actually shot on film. It's not shot on digital. Um, so it does have like this film grain look to it. It actually looked like a first into project film from like Martin Scorsese or something. And maybe that's just because of the, the, the casino and gambling element. Cause you know, Martin Scorsese did, did casino and that's a really great film. Who knows? Maybe that's why I felt that way. But as I was watching, I was like, this almost feels like a really small, like very early on 1960s, like, um, Martin Scorsese film. So I actually really do think that Joe Swanberg purposely did this on film to really kind of have like that classic quality to it. Um, and I think it actually really does help the film and the actual overall um, kind of impact of the movie because the way it does look does affect it. Because if this film was shot on digital, it wouldn't like make a huge difference. I'd be like, okay, it's shot on digital, whatever. But the fact that it was shot on actual like film stock I gotta commend him for it. I actually think it really helped the story quite a bit. and just adds like that extra pop of visual uh, like aesthetic. So I really do appreciate that. So guys, overall, this is... Yeah, it's, it's an easy watch. It's an entertaining movie. It's funny. It's heartfelt. I like Jake Johnson in it. And I'm glad he finally got to do a movie by himself. And this is probably my favorite Joe Swanberg movie. I'm gonna give Win It All a B. I think it's a very solid film, and I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, I really hope that Joe Swanberg and Jake Johnson continue to do more more movies together because it, it has shown in the past, and it's shown with this movie that they have wonderful chemistry. So, um, yeah, I really enjoyed this. And so if you guys want to kill an hour and a half, and if you want to watch a pretty decent little indie film, I would suggest Win It All on Netflix right now. So, guys... 
That will do it for my review coverage of the Dallas International Film Festival and the two mystery reviews with your name and um, win it all. So that is it for the show. Now let's go into the uh, uh, box office results for the weekend because I still got to do that for you guys. Um, the two big releases, Going in Style and um, Smurfs the Lost Village. Wonderful. Um, so, uh, well, first of all, your name actually came in 13th place and it opened up in 300 theaters and it made 1.6 million. That's actually not bad. It actually got $5,000 per theater, so that's wonderful. Gifted was also released in 56 theaters and made a little under 500,000. Not really good. It's a Chris Evans movie directed by Mark Webb. Um, Case for Christ, uh, another religious movie, 3.9 million with um, opening up in 1,100 theaters. 10th place. Eh, not pretty, not good. So number five. Holy shit. Um, Ghost in the Shell was 7.3 million. It dropped 60 percent wow yeah this movie's tanking pretty bad guys um so if this will open up all right so its budget's 110 million and with advertising and doubling it up for because the theaters got to take their cut it's probably going to make about 250 million to break even and the fact that it's only made 124 worldwide is very very bad and it's only made 31 here domestically which is even worse. So, yeah, this movie is not going to do well for Paramount. And Paramount's not doing good in general. So, I really feel sorry for them. And, uh, you know, the only moneymaker they really got going on right now is any horror film that they might pump out their anus or um, Transformers. So, there you go. Number four is a new release. And it's Going in Style with $12.5 million. <sighs> If this will open up here. Oh, God. It's going to update fucking box office mojo man like whatever i'll just do it from here so its budget is 25 million and it opened up with 12.5 that's it's reasonable i guess you double that that's 50 with marketing and stuff they didn't really do that much to it so i'd say about 60 million maybe to break even 12.5 i guess it's fine it might do better on streaming but i just don't think that people wanted to go out and pay for it in theaters you know case in point me um number three is smurfs the lost village with 14 million Ooh, that's not good. Um, on a budget of 60. Ugh. Okay, so now it's working. So on a budget of 60, you got to double that, 120. PA marketing, I'm going to say about mm, 130, maybe 140 to break even. It's made 56 worldwide so far because it made about 42 million overseas. Ugh, fucking why? Um, so, yeah, not, not good. <laughs> I think people are getting sick and tired of that movie. Once again, didn't want to go see it. Uh, so yeah, um, number two is Beauty and the Beast with twenty five million. It fell forty four percent. Oh my god, this movie's making such a buttload of money. Like what the hell? One hundred sixty million dollar budget, right? Doubled that to three twenty, and with the PA marketing, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say a cool four hundred million because they put a lot of marketing into this shit. Four hundred to break even, right? It is twenty three million dollars away from making a billion. What the fuck? 432 million domestically and 977 worldwide. It's going to hit that billion dollar mark. I thought Beauty and the Beast was the weakest thing they've done next to Maleficent and Alice in Wonderland uh, in terms of live action. I've only really ever liked um, The Jungle Book. Didn't see Cinderella, but yeah, Beauty and the Beast is such a blah movie and I actually think it works better in animated form. You guys know this. I just, ah, it's making so much money. Why? People love it. Why? And number one, uh, just like last week, is The Boss Baby with $26.3 million. I've lost faith in humanity. It dropped 47%, so at least, that's good, I guess. Um, its budget is unknown, but domestically it's made $89 million and worldwide it's made $199, so $200, uh, roughly. And, uh, sure. <laughs> I did not like the movie whatsoever, so there you go. And, guys, that will do it for this week's episode of Real Man Colony Movie Podcast. It went on a little long today, but, hey, when when you're covering a festival, you got a lot of shit to talk about. Now, I once again, I'd like to apologize just real fast. I realized that uh, I didn't really have my typical review style, you know, with breaking down into sections. Uh, you know, I've been told from people that's not the way to go and try to mix up your style a little bit, make it more 
professional, so I'm trying my best to like do something different with the whole reviewing and just kind of review it. You know, like people would write reviews and whatnot and just kind of have about three paragraphs worth of dialogue and just really kind of mix everything in together and kind of make sure it just flows well. I'm trying my best, guys, so I apologize for the, the shift and whatnot, but hopefully next week I'll get the better hang of it uh, when I have Joel back on. And uh, speaking of Joel, next week, episode 178 will be over Colossal and Fate of the Furious. Ugh, I hate saying that name. It's it's Fast 8. Um, so those will be the two main reviews uh, to come up next week. And then Joel will also have a mini review of France, which is a film that was also the Dallas International Film Festival. So those will be the three main ones the following week. For episode 179, we will have Graham Zima back on the show, and we will do the summer preview. So, everything from May to August, and Joel, Graham, and myself will talk about everything that is the summer coming up. And the next week um, is over... Hold on, folks. I had had my list up. I know. I I was professional. I was prepared. Uh, (laughs) uh, And then uh, episode 180 will be over which is April 30th, which will be over The Circle and Free Fire. And then the following week, episode 181, will be Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. So that is your upcoming episodes for the forecast of this show. If you guys want to follow me on Twitter, it's at RealChaseLee. Follow me on uh, Spreaker, iTunes, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud. Like, subscribe, comment, share this around, and let people know it's pretty decent little listen you know and hopefully uh you guys found this episode interesting covering a smaller film festival of the city that i live in so there you go um yeah that's about it uh thank you guys for listening Uh, you guys are fucking awesome you guys are the the most kick-ass audience and continue to spread this around let's let's grow this a little bit let's you know make make this show stronger than it ever has been and let's break through all the other podcasters and be one of the best and um uh you know, it's because of you guys. You guys are my favorite audience in the world for sure. I appreciate even up until this point of doing it almost four years now, like there's still some diehard fans out there that listen to the show. I appreciate it. So that will do it for this week's episode of the Dallas International Film Festival, episode 177. Hey guys, listen, I'm Chase Lee. And if you are not a movie fan, you made through this entire podcast. Well, hopefully I convinced you to be one. So let me know down below what you're interested in, uh, Dallas Film Festival-wise. Which ones have you seen, all that stuff. Comment in the place where my face let me know. Joel will return next week where we're going to do Fate of the <laughs> Furious. I just hate saying that title. And Colossal. The intro and outro music is done by my friends, Bur- Bur- friends band Fervent Rose. But you can check all the links out in the description below. Peace out, everyone. Bye bye you guys ready to get your, your Fast and Furious on next week? Because I am. Let's race that car into a fucking wall or off the cliff. And let's get a little crazy. Bye-bye, everyone.